thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so I'll be talking about essentially about what are the right abstractions for understanding the mind as an algorithmic engine. Uh, feel free to interrupt me with questions at any time. So um, how the mind interacts with the world is a deeply fundamental question. And the world throws at us sights and sounds and we try to make sense of it and to make uh, predictions and decide what actions to take. Now, let's try to understand this, how, how we do this, not from a physiological perspective, that is how the brain does this, but rather if we were to have a logical architecture for the mind, like a block diagram, then what would be the algorithmic comp components? What kind of data structures? Should we think about the mind as an, in an abstract sense as a single deep network? Is that the right, right abstraction? Or are there multiple modules? Maybe each module is a separate deep network. Maybe there's some other modules which are not deep networks, there's something else. How do we form new concepts? How do we remember things? Is there some memory table? There's this ancient mnemonic called as a tabula rasa, which thinks of the mind as a table, which is born with a clean slate, and then we enter entries as we, as we grow up uh, interacting with the world. So let's just focus first on uh, an abstract understanding of how do we remember things? Uh, so let's say you just meet someone for a chat over coffee. How do you remember what we talked about? Who was the person we met? Um, and more importantly, more importantly, how is this organized, indexed? And let's say we meet the person again, then how do we recall and retrieve the previous meeting and its content so that at the next meeting, we can decide what to say? And let me remind again that we're not looking for a physiological understanding of exactly how this is done in the brain, but more uh, an architectural understanding. So think of this like a, as a thought experiment. So the first half of the talk will go over just this conceptual understanding, and then we will get to, into empirical studies. So if we close our eyes, then we can recall sights, sounds, thoughts from uh, that have happened in the past, which means that maybe what we the way we remember things is like a sketch. And what I mean by sketch is like it's an approximate summary of what we experienced that can be a recon that can be used to reconstruct the original experience approximately. So we may not remember the, the sight or the sound exactly, but we rem might remember the high level details. And another point to note is that our memory fades away gradually and not suddenly, which means that as we forget things, we don't suddenly forget everything about the event, but we might still remember the high level details of the presentation or the high level uh, feature of a person. Uh, I might forget the, the later details. And perhaps in our mind, we have uh, some kind of uh, module, a modular structure. So maybe we have thousands of modules, like we have one module for, um, for face recognition, one module for speech analysis, which produces speech embeddings, maybe another module for driving cars, walking on the road, doing math. Uh, so at a logical level, maybe we can think of the mind as a, module, as a modular uh, network. Let's, let's forget for a moment how these modules arise. Uh, let's assume that there's such a modular network. And maybe at any one of point of time, only a small number of modules are really fine. So this is, for example, uh, representing some hierarchical modular structure. And maybe when you're looking at a person, uh, only the small skeleton of uh, modules are fine. And when we want to remember this event, essentially what we want to remember is which modules fired and with what value. So let's say each module is, fire, is firing with some embeddings, like a, a person detection module is firing with some embedding about uh, which encodes a person and a speech recognition module is firing with some embedding about what were the topics and what are the rough contents that were spoken. Any questions? So how would you go about sketching this, remembering this skeleton that fired and with the values it fired? So there's a very simple method to do this, which is basically subspace embedding. Uh, to understand this, let's for a moment assume that all the modules are in just one flat level, uh, not in hierarchy. So let's say thousands of modules uh, at just one level of hierarchy, and only a couple of modules are firing. Let's say this, you know, when you meet someone, then it's just the face recognition, the person recognition module that is firing, and the speech system uh, topic detection module that is firing. So you, just these two modules are firing with some embedding values, um, and the remaining ones are not firing, they're firing with zero values. So these XIs here are the embedding outputs from all these thousands of modules, and only a couple of the, it's sparse outputs, so only a couple of them are non-zero. So how would you remember this as a sketch? How would you sketch all this into a compact representation? Uh, it's very simple. You just use a random rotation matrix uh, for each module. And this random rotation matrix is fixed. It's pre-decided for each module. 
and you use this, you hit the each output vector with this random rotation matrix so that it rotates it and puts it in a random direction, and then you add these up. And that is your final sketch. So if you have a couple of such uh, modules which are non-zero outputs, then all you need is the output dimension of Y is a little more than uh, twice the dimension of each of the XIs. And if you have that, then information theoretically, you have all the information in Y to exactly figure out all the Xs. But in particular, you can figure out exactly which modules fired and with, with what values. And this is basically because uh, of this uh, idea of sparse recovery and sparse encoding. Um, because, uh, so one simple way to do with this is you just, if you want to find out if a particular module has fired, you just multiply the out the sketch Y with the RI inverse, or rather RI transpose is close to the RI inverse because it's a random matrix, so the transpose is going to be close to the inverse. And if you multiply, multiply with RI inverse and you see that it has a high value, then you know that that module has a non-zero input, and that is approximately equal to the XI. And if it doesn't have a high value, then it's, it's zero. So this is a very simple idea uh, to do um, sketching using sparse encoding. Any questions about this? Are most people familiar with sparse uh, sparse encoding? Uh, one quick question. So why do we want several module to um, in in why when why don't we have like different Y for different module? So so we have so the premise is that we have lots of modules in our mind, thousands okay. of them for one for each activity, and only a few of them are uh, firing with non-zero values. All the others are zeros. And we want a uniform method to take these outputs, apply some operation to get a sketch in such a way that the sketch is enough to tell us which module fired and with what values. Now, uh, okay, you, want to share, you want to share memory across all modules? Yes, yes. Okay. I mean, you could, we could, for example, just store, instead of doing this sketch this way, you could have just said, okay, I will keep a specific format saying these are the pointers to the modules and these are the outputs of these modules. I could do that. But that is not a uniform like uh, that'd be a very specific uh, object oriented representation of what is fired. It's not, it's very, um, uh, it doesn't match with what the intuitions that we have about having dense representations uh, in deep networks. So this is a very simple method that gives a dense representation and it's sufficient, that dense represent compact representation is sufficient to get the actual fields in terms of which module was fired and with what values. Got it. Thanks. So this is exactly like um, sparse recovery and dictionary learning, except that in sparse recovery, you don't have, you're not packing um, vector, a collection of vectors, sparse collection of vectors, but you're packing a sparse collection of bits. So you have uh, many thousands of bits and only a few of them are non-zero. So that's the only difference here. So this is a simple idea that works for um, one layer of modules. Now, what if you have a hierarchy of modules? How would you then get the sketch? And again, the idea is very simple. All you do is this XI, instead of being the output of the module I, you recursively compute the sketch of the inputs to the module I, and you append that to this XI. So XI is now just, not just the output of the, of the module MI, but also recursively what has been fed into it. So now when you are given Y, you can, recurs you can get these XIs, and now if recursively you can go down and keep recovering what, what are the previous mod layer modules that fired. Any questions? So what this does is it gives you a uniform way of sketching every activity into a sketch space. And uh, one important property of this method of sketching is that similar events will result in similar sketches. So if you meet the same person over coffee and next time, uh, pretty much the same modules are firing with almost the same values. And that's why the final dense sketches that you get will be will be pointing in almost the same direction. And uh, not just that, um, the the sketch of a meeting with a person is actually going to be similar to the sketch of the person itself. So uh, so uh, the sketch of a compound a compound we call that as compound sketch. Why is it a compound sketch? Because it refers to a person and a topic of discussion. So the the compound sketch of both these two is similar to the uh, sketch of uh, the individual components. And the reason for that is I said these matrices are random, uh, but actually they're random, not with mean zero, but with mean uh, identity. So the mean value is identity. So when you take the mean value of identity, then uh, the sketch of uh, 
the expected value of the sketch of two modules firing is going to be x so let's say x1 and x2 are firing the modules one and two are firing then you will have some component of x1 in there and some component of x2 in there so the the sketch of the meeting will have some similarity with the sketch of the individual person and the topic as well so essentially this uh, allows us to do type encoding why because you can think of each module's output as a, as a as a type of an object so you can say that all persons are in or of are one type and they all lie in this particular subspace or this particular direction and all animals are in this type and so on and so forth and this also allows you to discover new concepts uh, because when you see a new type of thing essentially it'll give rise to um, points arising in a new region in an unseen region in the sketch space so let's say you see a tiger which you haven't seen before and see a few of them so in terms of the previous level modules, um, it will produce a sketch and all these sketches will tend to lie in a single subspace or a single cluster. So now when you see points in that cluster, you know that it is, I'm seeing some new region and it's time to now form a new concept and you can now grow a new module. So this is roughly how a new module would form. We'll get into precise details later. So what this does is we get this we can take all these sketches that you accumulate over your uh, lifetime and we we can create a, a sketch repository that can form a knowledge graph so each sketch um, points to other sketches based on how similar they are or whether they refer to each other and the sketch uh, this this knowledge graph and sketch repository interacts with the modular network so when i'm meeting a person next for coffee that time this modular network will try to retrieve the sketch from related sketches from from the knowledge graph which will retrieve the previous meetings sketch and the related information so as a conceptual study what we, what we can do is you can use this to prove specific theorems uh specifically specifically we can show yeah uh, i see a question there how might affect work uh, can someone just open that i can't i'm not on the, i'm not on the uh, what is the question so the question was, how might affect work in this model at the module level or the sketch level? Ah, emotions. Oh, those are a great. That's a great topic, actually. Um, so I think you can think that each um, module. Um, so maybe there is a maybe there are modules for producing emotions, um, and each module can output can send some information to that module. So maybe there is a module for pleasure, pain, anger, envy, and those kind of things. And whenever those modules are triggered, you produce those emotions. So you can think of that as basically uh, specific dimensions in uh, in the sketch space. Yeah, Anna. I was just wondering, um, for uh, is your is your intention to create something that is very similar to how a human mind actually works? Um, because if for, for affect, um, there's some research that indicates that it's, it's uh, emotions are much more like language um, than they yeah. do. in other words, there's not, there's, there are no universal emotions and, and so on. Yeah, yeah. So uh, a very good question. So uh, certainly there is no claim of the sort that what I'm doing here is a true depiction of the human mind. So that's not the exact goal. It's a caricature. It's a mathematical caricature. So it's an extremely simplified version, and it is definitely not focusing on emotions that much. It is more focusing on the algorithmic abilities. Um, and we're not trying to do exactly what the mind does or the brain does, but only trying to mimic its ability. So think of it as an artificial mind um, inspired from, from intuitive examination of what the mind does. So it's think of it as an artificial mind. Uh, how, how do you compare function to hippocampus, let's say, where it's actually memorizing stuff with like symbolic? Yeah, so uh, what, I, all I've, what I've heard, which seems to match with this, is that hippocampus is like a lookup table, uh, maybe yeah. even a look, look, uh, similarity search lookup table. Yep. So, uh, so that's definitely an, uh, an inspiring uh, connection. Uh, but again, as I said, I don't know exactly how these things map to um, the brain. And this is more of a thought experiment or more like a, if you just observe events in the mind, this maybe this is what seems to happen. 
Got it. Yeah, there was another question. I, I, I didn't see the feedback. Yes. Um, how, how the modules are created or run? It's uh, something that you do uh, hard code or you redefine? Uh, yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll mention that a little bit later also, but essentially when you find a new region in Sketchspace that is suddenly uh, getting hit, so events are forming, which, which are there, like secret tigers, then you know that uh, I need to form a new module. So um, if we use locality sensitive hashing, that corresponds to a bucket. And so in that bucket, we actually allocate a module, like a small deep network. And the deep network will be trained to do things like, okay, remember how the tiger behaves, or or remember if I take, if, if I delete events, like I mask out portions of tiger, I mask out what it does, then can you predict it? So you can use both unsupervised and supervised learning to, uh, to understand the concept better. Okay, uh, um, one comment. Uh, have you heard about the uh, holographic reduced representation? from plate uh, that is very similar to what you are doing. Holograph no, I haven't done. Holographic, did you say? Holographic reduced representation. No, I haven't heard about plate. So yeah, it's something that was around for 20 years that used the same kind of uh, mm -hmm. representation with the types and the rotations and some other. Mm -hmm. I've heard of things like uh, the light signals all around us are a holographic distributed representation of an yeah. image it, it's yeah the 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 name may be misleading but it's, it's essentially same concept uh, and there are other things I, I i can send you some papers oh sure absolutely i'd love to see that Thanks. so because you can prove prove that similar events will have similar sketches you essentially get a knowledge graph and then you can actually reconstruct um the the DAG of events uh, from the uh, from the sketch. So as long as the DAG is small enough, you can get the get the entire DAG and all the modules and the values uh, precisely. Uh, if not, you can get the top level values and you can get some summary for the remaining ones. So if you have a if you have an event which is complicated, like let's say you have hundreds of people in a room, and if you have a very small sketch for that, there's no way you're going to be able to use the sketch to recover all the details about each of the people each of the persons there, but you can use it to do some uh, statistical analysis. For example, you'll be able to get things like, uh, you know, what is the average uh, height of the per people in the room or where most of them wearing dark shirts. Uh, you can get like uh, histogramming, counting, variance kind of uh, details. And the reason you get that is because, uh, as I said, these RIs are random with mean identity. So in expectation, the Y is just a summation of all these exercises. So we have hundreds of people, you're just adding them up and averaging them. And that's how you can get the mean values. But you also get higher moments because if you attach a small non-linearity non on top of this, so instead of Ri times Xi, you just take Sigma times Ri times Xi. Then that non-linearity essentially can be viewed as a polynomial uh, in Xi. And the polynomial gives you the higher, higher, higher moments. And um, this also gives you this interpretable object-oriented view because, as I said, you have a dense representation, a sketch which is a dense representation, but it points to a tuple of values coming out, and these tuples can have further fields in it. Um, so you get this object-oriented interpretation, and it's a protocol-independent way of communicating across modules. So, um, yeah, so it's like. You can think of it as if I want to tell someone that I found a person, then you just pack that information in that subspace and you send, you just broadcast a sketch. And any, any module which is looking for a person can just listen on that subspace. And this also uh, gives rise, can be used to construct an architecture for continual learning where new concepts are, are discovered. And the new concept is nothing but a, a sketch in a you know, new cluster in the sketch space. And at that point, you can start forming a, a new module. Any questions here? So this slide shows roughly how you can get a continual learning architecture where the external world is throwing <clears throat> sights and sounds <clears throat> and you get that as a sketch and you use that sketch to index into an LSH table. So the LSH table is, is a sketch repository. And we also have modules in these uh, buckets, this, the table of these buckets. So if you see a tiger, then the tiger will uh, fall into a new bucket. So, uh, so a new concept is nothing but 
um, a new bucket that is becoming frequently accessed. And that's where you will you create a module for the tiger, which will uh, learn how to fill mis masked entries and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a continuous loop where, where you, you get an external sketch, you use that, uh, you go to the bucket, you get the, the small module in the bucket, you run the module, and that will in turn produce new sketches. So let's say if I see a tiger, then I, I, I in the module it says, okay, run, run from the tiger. And the run is also sketched. So now you have to actuate your actual motions for the run, right? So, so the run sketch will now go to another bucket, which will tell what are the motor action, motor movements required for running. So there will be another module for running. So these modules are formed over time. So we're saying that there's a routing module which uh, routes the sketches into into buckets. Uh, and there's, I, this is in this link. There's this context, the word context. It is nothing but some subset of the sketch because when you have a, sketch, a full sketch, you might at times you might uh, you might uh, pay more attention to some fields in the sketch and sometimes not pay uh, too much attention to some fields. For example, if I see a person, I might pay more attention to the facial features and not so much to the dress the person is wearing. So the context is just some refinement of the sketch. And we can also include uh, edges across buckets. And the edges are just formed by co-occurrence, frequent co-occurrence. So for example, if I see two friends free, uh, commonly uh, together, then I could create an, an edge between those, those two buckets for those two friends. So what that does is now if I see one of the poor people, then by using this edge, I know that he, that person is related to this other friend. So, um, or for example, if I'm, uh, if I'm cooking uh, a dish, then I know that this particular action of boiling, the, boiling uh, the pan is frequently followed by now adding spice. So these two sketches are frequently co-occurred. So by putting in that edge, I know that after this sketch, I will frequently have, uh, have uh, the sketch of adding spice. And actually I can get through, through this uh, edges, I can get a long chain of, chain of sketches. So these edges actually form, can, form a, can form a knowledge graph. So what you have in the LSH table is, is essentially a graph of sketches, uh, which have some modules in them, which are programs, and they form a knowledge graph. Any questions? So what this does, yes, Eric? In terms of the knowledge graph that comes about from this, it seems like the edges would be undirected. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, well, it depends. You can have some directionality. For example, if A follows B in time, then you could have that information placed on the edge. But if it's just co-occurrence, then it is, it's, uh, it's, you're right, it's undirected. But if it's a reference, if it's like A contains B. So for example, a meeting with a person contains the, a reference is the person. So you could have that. Understood. So there'd be another level constructing the knowledge graph, then it's not just implicit based on clustering, I take it. Uh, so the clustering is just uh, identifying the nodes, and because uh, there's a compound sketch which always has uh, one point in this cluster and one point in this cluster. So let's say one point in um, this person cluster and one point in this uh, speech topic cluster. So these two points co-occur, and that's why those two buckets will point to each other. So when I, if I if I see you and always you're always talking about um, language understanding, let's say, so then the language understanding sketch bucket will point to uh, your person sketch. Understood. So the clustering constructs the buckets, and then the knowledge graph is built on top of that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah so essentially, this uh, LSH buckets can be viewed as a graph uh, where each node is a bucket, it essentially corresponds to con concept. And within that bucket is a small module uh, or program that you run. And what you're doing is, as you're doing your computations or thinking, you are traversing over this graph. Um, so, so think, for example, if you're, uh, and, and your this traversals could either be passing over static edges or dynamic edges. So think about if you're cooking a dish, like making pasta, then, then there are these, hard-coded static links saying first uh, heat the pan, boil water, 
as this and so forth. So that sequence is very hard and repeated. So that chain, that, that chain of sketches is so hardened that it, it becomes like a, essentially like a single compound sketch that points to the chain. But it can also be dynamic. So think like a mathematical cal cal calculation where you're doing some integral and then out comes the next expression and so on and so forth. So there, what the next sketch uh, of the next equation that will come out is, is only known after, after running the previous, uh, completing the previous sketch. Um, and also think about how we run through thoughts. So we have a thought which can be thought of as a sketch and then we process the thought, execute it in some sense, and that leads to the creation of the next thought. And um, uh, it, it doesn't have to be that, uh, so, so maybe the thought ha is consists of multiple entities and uh, which are the component sketches and then they uh, access pro programs which are in the LSH table, the modules, and execute those and that collectively produces the next thought. So this pathway, uh, it's, it's looking like it's it's visiting only one node at a time, but maybe there are multiple such parallel pathways, which means that you have a few sketches, or you can think of it as compound sketch consisting of a few sketches, and um, these sketches retrieve programs uh, from the LSH memory, execute those, and produce a new set of sketches. And these sketches could actually be combined; uh, they could interact with each other. So certain sketches could be combined. For example, the sketch of a name of a person and the image of a person they could be combined into a single sketch because there is an edge, frequent edge between the two. So uh, the, the eventual architecture looks like essentially um, a graph, like a decision graph, like a decision tree, but like a decision graph of modules which are individually deep learned. Any questions? So this is actually looking a bit like transformers because in transformers uh, you have Instead of sketches, you have tokens. So you have the tokens, which are multiple tokens, like let's say 10 tokens, if a sentence of 10 tokens, then 10 tokens are coming in. At each time, uh, the 10 tokens access their uh, feed forward modules, uh, they get transformed, and then they attend to each other, and then they combine in different ways, and then again, they get transformed through the feed forward uh, network. The only difference here is that the feed forward networks are programmed, they could be separate ones for each one. So that was the conceptual part of the talk. Now let's go a little bit into the more empirical parts where we apply these ideas for on certain products. And uh, the, in particular, we'll talk about neural memory, which is how do you take a deep network and expand its capability by attaching an external memory to it, just as, as you would attach a RAM to a, to a CPU. So, can, so a neural network has this inefficiency that you burn all its uh, all its neurons in every computation. Whereas if you attach memory, then you're only accessing a few rows of the memory each time. So maybe you can actually expand the ability and the capacity of the network without increasing the, uh, without increasing the uh, uh, latency and the flops. Here's the, so the slides are shared actually, it's in the email as well that I sent. So we took a very simplified version of the LSH sketch repository and uh, attached it to a deep network, in particular to BERT. Uh, we did ex something extremely simple, uh, which is use an LSH table uh, between every two layers. We look at the output of the previous layer and we use that to index into an LSH table, a locality sensitive hash table. And then with, uh, so let's say we ha access some location in this LSH table, and then we retrieve the value there and we just add that to the previous layer's output before giving it to the next layer. That's all we do. And instead of just one LSH lookup, we might do a few LSH lookups. Uh, so we don't really store sketches as we described. This is very simple. And we just, the, the content of this LSH table is trainable. Any questions on how this is implemented? Disjoint union or literal add. So we have two variants. Here I'm showing add. We can also do a concatenation. I think most of our experiments with, an, with addition but we want to do more experiments with concatenation. So this is uh, an observation. This is what we found on BERT. So we found that you will expand the capacity of a BERT model significantly by attaching a small amount of neural memory. Uh, even if you have 15% more um, number of size, memory which is 15% of the size of the original model, we can almost get a capacity which is double the uh, we can almost get performance, which is that of double the size of the BERT model. So for example, here on the MNLI task, 
bird small has a certain performance and bird medium which is double the size has a certain performance but by just by adding this sketch memory we get a performance which actually exceeds the that of the of the bird medium which is actually double the flops but here we since we are adding memory and we are doing sparse lookups the increase in the number of flops is actually less than 1% any questions and similar result, experiments were done for image classification, in particularly for the long tail image classification, where you have lots and lots of long tail classes. And again, just by attaching uh, a memory of a, a hash table of certain size at the last layer before the softmax, we found that the performance, the accuracy on the tail classes was much better. It was even better than some of the other methods, which were specifically handcrafted for this problem. Now, there's also a, a, a very meaningful connection between what we are doing in terms of neural memory and switch transformers. So switch transformers is essentially transformers, but instead of a single feed forward layer, you have an array of feed forward layers. You can think of it as a table of feed forward layers. And there's a router which actually takes the token and routes it to one of the feedforward layers. So this is exactly um, neural can be thought of as neural memory. Why? Because you can think that this this sequence of feedforward layers is actually in a hash table, and you can think of this route ha, router as a hash function. And instead of the table only being a table of values that you add, you can think that this table has a small module in each of them. And a module is nothing, you can think of a small rank K matrix. If K is large enough, then you can think of it as a feed forward layer. So then what you're doing is you're taking a token, you're looking it up, and instead of using this feed forward layer, you're actually retrieving a feed forward layer. Maybe you're augmenting it to this feed forward layer, and then you're processing it. And um, also the notion of embedding tables, even though embedding tables are not really used in uh, transformers, you can, um, if you append, if you augment the transformer with this uh, LSH table, then you can think as if you have an, you can think that this is like an embedding table, but instead of just accessing the embedding table as an input layer, you're accessing it at every layer. Now, more generally, I think you should also have, in the external memory, you should also have uh, handcrafted data, like for example, entities, uh, knowledge graph entities, like just as the, uh, just as in the realm paper or the entities or the expert paper. So in the long run, I think you should have both trainable parts in this LSH memory and also uh, learned, also hand handcrafted parts like KG, KG entities. In conclusion, we saw one proposal for a continual learning architecture based on sketching and locality sensitive hatching that also gives a method for implementing neural memory. Here are the references. All the links to these references are provided in the description below. There is also a link to a panel discussion on a mathematical model for the mind, which includes uh, Turing Award winner Jeffrey Hinton and neuroscientist Jack Gallant and others.